All too often, we fail to remember much of history during modern sports debates, only to be reminded later that nothing is new. Baseball seems to be somewhat of a unique exception, with fans remembering many of the greats of decades past. Yet even history has an imperfect record of remembrance, especially when a player's career doesn't end in typical fashion. This is what you don't know about Ed De La Hanty. where we delve into the forgotten stories, teams, and athletes of sports history and question widely held takes on today's sports. I'm Blake, and this is Matt. Howdy. And today, in honor of the current, as of this recording, lack of baseball activities, we're going to tell you about one of baseball's greatest hitters that you may have never heard of. I know I had not. Um, I think you said you also had not when we discussed doing writing this episode. No idea, yeah. Mr. Ed DeLahanty. If you know who that is, congratulations. But we're going to tell you if you don't. Matt, a little bit of foreshadowing here, but um, who would be on your Mount Rushmore for best sporting families? And by that I mean most most athletically accomplished, most athletically gifted, like however you interpret that. Yeah, that's that's a tough question, right? Because there are plenty of siblings, father, sons, cousins, you know, that have played multiple sports throughout the years. I think if you're doing a if you're doing a Mount Rushmore, I think some easy answers are like the Manning family with Peyton and Eli and Archie, and also Cooper, I guess. Uh, and then and then the next generation has Arch who hasn't done anything yet, but is Nothing. making SEC schools <laughs> lose their minds. Um, the Williams sisters, I think, have to be on it because both of them are were, were and are so good at the sport of tennis. I think that um, one that's off the wall, the Alou family in baseball, uh, all three brothers once played in the outfield together at the same time, which is incredible it's pretty neat um a fourth one i guess uh i would go i think i would stay baseball like the griffies the bonds something like that the ripkins would be a good fourth slot that's that's more than two people that's two people in a generation and a father so i yeah that's it's a good question it is interesting to think about that because we don't i don't know that we talk about that a whole ton we just talk about like greatest athletes right and so we compare, we try and compare one person today to all of history. It's like, that's a really difficult conversation to have, but it is fun to talk about. There's less, there's, there's less options when you talk about sporting families, uh, like uh, relatives who have competed at the highest level and done that sort of thing. I knew you were going to say the Griffies. That was going to be one of mine, uh, the father, son Griffies. Uh, Vlad Guerrero, senior and junior, come to yeah. mind, even though he's really like the junior's really young in his career. Yeah. Um, but definitely the Bonds and the Ripkins. I think the Williams sisters probably, I mean, I think they easily take the um, the tennis cake. But as far as just mo- so many people to perform at a high level, Mannings might Mannings might have it just just yeah. because of how much winning they did in their sport. Yeah, and we left out the whole sport of NASCAR, but that's okay. Yeah, we could get that's like that's like seventeen pages long. We don't want to we don't want to get into all that. There's a there's so much family involvement in NASCAR; it's actually ridiculous. But yeah. uh, we could go down that road uh, for another episode. Maybe we'll just make a NASCAR families episode and just Maybe. talk about the most. Success- I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, <clears throat> like I said a minute ago. Um, Currently, as of this recording, hopefully not long after this recording, it will get settled. But um, the ongoing lack of current baseball activities with discussions and 
uh, CBA talks and all of that stuff have a lot of us missing baseball just a little bit. And so we're either turning into minor league baseball when it starts, if that ever starts, college baseball especially, uh, Tommy Tanks. Tommy, Tommy Tanks at State is, is going off right now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so we thought of, we found, we we came across Ed Delahanty's name somehow, I don't even remember, and it turns out he's one of the greatest hitters in league history, and I had never heard his name before. So we did some research, and we're going to tell you about him. So on October 30th, 1867, that is not a typo. 1867, Edward James Delahanty was born in Cleveland, Ohio, to Bridget and James, both of whom were Irish immigrants. They had immigrated just two years prior to Ed's birth. Ed was actually the second child born to Bridget and James, but the first did not survive infancy. His father worked odd blue-collar jobs throughout Ed's youth, and the mother Bridget actually turned their home into a boarding house so that they could make money. And turning your house into a boarding house is cool if, like, you don't have a ton of people there, you know. But what I'm about to tell you is about to, like, freak you out a little bit. Uh, Joe, uh, Joe I've, I've read too far down. Ed grew up playing baseball in vacant lots in the neighborhood of Cleveland with his brothers. Brothers Jim, Tom, Joe... Frank, and Willie. Ed is the oldest of six boys, all of whom played at least minor league baseball. At least minor league. I think one or two of them only played minor league. The rest played at least some, if not all, major league baseball. And Ed was the most talented of them all, but six, six, that for, from the foreshadowing earlier of best sports families. By pure numbers... That's a lot of people. <laughs> that's a lot of people, and they're they, they're living in a boarding house, so that's a lot more people. And I feel like we've seen this deal where like uh, siblings had some some athletic talent. I don't think you normally see the oldest sibling be the one that makes a mark, right? Usually, there's there's something about being later on, and not necessarily always the last child, but but somewhere after the first one because you're trying to to reach up to where that person already is developmentally. So that is interesting that the the oldest sibling there is the the one that leaves the biggest mark uh even though we forgot about him over time. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that is that was interesting. That's interesting to me. A boarding house, two parents, six kids and a bunch of strangers. Great idea, right? You had to do what you had to do. So kudos to them. Mhm. Mm mm -hmm. Ed would go on, uh, he would play for various semi-pro teams growing up. He would play for the Cleveland Shamrocks, uh, making, I think it was $50 a month playing for the Cleveland Shamrocks semi-pro. Then he would move on to the Ohio State League. Then he moved on to play in the Tri-State League in West Virginia. And then that team sold him to the Philadelphia Phillies. And he began his career with the Phillies on May 22nd. 1888. Now, remember what time frame this is. This is the late 1800s, okay? His first game as a Philly took over for second baseman Charlie Ferguson. Charlie Ferguson had died not long before that in the middle of the season from typhoid fever. I think I think Charlie Ferguson was in his fourth. Correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, whoever's listening. Correct me if I'm wrong. Fourth season playing Major League Baseball, and he died of typhoid fever. And so the Phillies bought De La Ante, and that's why he eventually made this debut. Yep, a thing, a thing. You are closer. These people were closer to the Oregon Trail being a thing. So uh, people of my generation, you played that as a kid, right? Typhoid and dysentery and all kinds of other things. Um, we're closer to that than we are to modern times. And um, so thankfully, we've successfully avoided death from things like typhoid fever. But yeah. uh, definitely something you had to account for when you were building a roster in 1888. Yeah, yeah. So bottom in the middle of the season. He finished his first season with the Phillies after playing 74 games with only a 228 average. 
you might be wondering why I tell you that he's one of the best hitters in Major League Baseball history. After he goes his first season playing half a season, hitting 228, he hit one home run and 31 RBIs. It gets better. His second season was slightly better. He played only 56 games for the Phillies, but his average bumped up. He hit a 293. In 1890, he left Philadelphia. A new league, because back then this happened regularly, the Players League just came out of nowhere. And pay disputes with the National League and the American Association kind of confused a bunch of people. And so some people jumped ship from the National League to go play elsewhere. Well, the Players League would fold after one season and the American Association would collapse the following year. And many of those teams within the Players League and the American Association would end up just getting absorbed by the National League in the late early 1890s after their leagues died. And so you go out on this fishing expedition, if you will, if you're a player, like, oh, I want more money. Let's go do the startup league. They've got some money. And then they actually don't. And they fail after a year and two years, I think, consecutively. So mm-hmm. comes back home to Philly in 1891. Again, though, still struggling. He only hit 243. This is three seasons without a 300 hitting season. And yet you're going to be surprised, I think. His poor performances were attributed to ex- excessive alcohol consumption. So he had a drinking problem early on in his in his adult life. But he came back in 1892 for the season in the best shape of his life. Apparently, he rededicated himself to baseball. And in 1892, he hit 306, and he led the league in triples and in slugging. And then this is when this uh, he, he was like a struggling infielder. And apparently, this is the season that he found his calling playing in the outfield. He had a lot of speed. Uh, I think he led the I think he led the National League uh, in stolen bases for at least one season. And he had a heck of an arm, so he loved playing outfield. He got to run around a lot. He could catch balls that other people couldn't catch up to, and he had great throwing range. So he kind of finds his calling at, during the eighteen ninety two season. Yeah, I think um, I think baseball players in particular, the way that they lived during the season lent itself to uh alcoholism uh we see that in a lot of players right babe ruth apparently is the only person it did not bother (laughs) too much yeah although looking at looking at delahanty maybe it did right if this guy goes from hitting sub 300 as low as 228 then just says you know what i'm not going to do this anymore and suddenly goes 306 maybe babe should have also laid off of, you know, 40 years later, maybe he's hitting 90 home runs a year and uh, it's even a bigger deal. I don't know, but Ooh. definitely, definitely if you're going to be an athlete, you don't want to be hung over all the time. I don't think that's probably detrimental. That should be rule number one. in like the professional athlete book is uh, rule number one. Don't but, play under the influence. But then you've got like freaks of nature that just, it doesn't matter. Like, like all the stories about Michael Jordan just getting on planes and going to gamble and they get to the city they're playing in and he's still just playing cards till daylight and sleeps two hours and puts up 50 points. Like sometimes apparently it doesn't matter, but for most of us, some people are built different. Some people are just built different. Some, I, I, I don't know any other way. Some some people live off two hours, three hours of sleep. Some people can't perform on nine. Mm. Like you, you just some people are just made differently than others. And that's that's the only way I know how to put it. So for Ed, after this coming to light and and finding his calling playing outfield, the rest of the eighteen nineties for him were just absolutely s- full of outstanding baseball. This is where the numbers are gonna are gonna blow your mind. 1893, I'm going to run through some of his seasons here in the in the 1890s real quick. 1893, finished the season, hit 368, 19 home runs, 146 RBIs. 1894, the Phillies had four outfielders who averaged a 400 batting average or better. Delahanty is one of them. He hit 407, four home runs, 131 RBIs. 1895, he hit 404, 19, uh, 11 home runs, excuse me, 
and 106 RBIs. And in 1896, he hit 397, 13 home runs, and 126 RBIs. Like that, that might be the best, the best four year stretch of baseball ever. I don't know. Like that, that's just incredible. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at RBI numbers and averages. I'm looking at his, his baseball reference page, and those are those are otherworldly stats when you start looking at some of the some of the more they're not even advanced metrics, but like his OPS in ninety five was one point one and then then ninety six one point one again. So that's back to back years one, like a thousand is is elite level. When you get to eleven hundred and twelve hundred, you're reaching Ruth and Bond's territory. Like that's where you're at and he did it back to back years he was over a thousand all four of those years you just mentioned (laughs) his ops plus so we're talking about like just how many bases he gets when he makes contact compared to the other people he's playing with was 186 and 190 in 95 and 96 that means that he's like 100 is average so he's 90 percent better almost double average than the average player (laughs) those are those are ridiculous stats um for anybody much less they obviously led the league too just if anybody was sure 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 and and like i said he in 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 94 he was just one of four philly outfielders who averaged 400 that season so Mm -hmm. in that 1896 season in particular he became just the second player to hit four home runs in a single game uh, two were in the stands over the wall. Two were inside the park home runs. That goes to show you his his speed. Uh, that, I mean, because one and you don't see in, you don't see those in Major League Baseball unless like six errors are committed on the same play. <laughs> you're just not gonna you're just not gonna see that. He did it twice in the same game. And yes, before we all say it at home, 1899 baseball was different than 2022 baseball. You don't need to remind us, but regardless. Like, it's it's still relevant, okay? Um, Up to 1899, his career best batting average year, he hit 410. He led the league with 238 hits that season, led the league with 55 doubles that season, and led the league that season with 137 RBIs, and that wasn't even his career high. He just hit hit 146 six years prior. In the 1899 season, he also hit for four doubles in a single game, which just sounds weird. He's still the only player to have a four home run game and a four double game in Major League Baseball history to have both. And in 1899, he finally won his first batting title. He's had three seasons so far with with a 400 plus batting average, and this is the first time he led the league in batting average. But this consistency, because he first hit for 400 five, six seasons prior to this and to still be doing it. Like you hit that well, you're going to get it once or you're on roids. If that happened today, you're either on roids for six years and you finally out and you finally outpace like the Maguire bonds, uh, Maguire Sosa race. You finally outpace the other guy because like the other guy gets in trouble or gets caught or something, runs out of money or whatever. (laughs) Or you're just so good and so consistent at hitting a baseball you can hit for 400 over a three times over a six-year span and you finally win the batting title author bill james says quote any way you cut it the phillies had the greatest outfield of the 19th century you got four outfielders hitting 400 four outfielders how do you have how do you have four Hey, four hey, outfielders hit it. What do you? How does that even? It's time happen? for your it's time for your day off. We're gonna try out another guy that's hitting four hundred. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about fighting for a roster spot. Jesus, everybody, everybody hits four hundred out here. I if if this was if this was nineteen nineties instead of the eighteen nineties, we're talking about this guy doing steroids. Yes, uh, but it, it just turns out that he he stopped drinking so much, and that was the same performance jump as juicing so there you go it's incredible right so here's a good stopping point because it is time i haven't figured out a cool like name for this yet but i swear i will one day uh it's not it and it probably won't be stump the sykes worthy but like muff the mat or something it's trivia time that needs work work. yeah see that was off the top that's all i had so (laughs) 
to workshop that one a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, that was like that was on the fly. That's all I had. <laughs> so here's your trivia question. And I've got an interesting stat that I found out while finding this trivia question. I didn't realize I didn't realize this. I thought that was this was really cool. But okay, here you go. Oh no. <laughs> uh, Ed De La Hanty, with the inclusion of Negro League players recently in the MLB record books is eighth all time in career batting average. He hit 345 or 346 if you round up for his career. Of the seven players above De La Hanty, of uh, of the seven players above De La Hanty all time in career batting averages, only one of them batted right-handed. Can you Are tell you me to... can you tell me who it was. <laughs> Think about it. Oh, absolutely it not, be, not. It might not be, it might not be as hard if you if you go through like we've talked about this list before. Yeah. And I can oh, okay. You, if right. you think if you think about the players above him, uh, he's eight, so there's seven options. Only Ed De La Hanty was a is a right handed batter. There's only one right handed batter above him. The question is, can I correctly remember who is above him? I, I think and you got I can questions. You got ten. Yeah, yeah, you got, got ten got questions. questions. You can. You can. We can narrow it down, right. and um, and we can go for it. So you can ask about the specific player. Yeah. You can. You can try to eliminate the the other players. <laughs> what is the first letter of his? I'm just kidding. That would be. I mean, that would help you a lot, but I'm not going to give you that <laughs> because that's um, a unique. When uh, when did he play? When did he play? Good first question. This player, the only right-handed batter above him in career all-time batting average. He played from 1915 to 1937. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes this easier. Who did he play for? Who did he play for? He played for first half of his career. He played for St. Louis. And then he went on to play for the New York Giants, the Chicago Cubs, and a couple other a couple other teams that are no longer in these cities. One of which is the St. Louis Browns, um, uh, and there's a, another team, the Boston Braves, who he played for for one season. Primarily, you probably know him as a Cardinal. Oh, from, that got from, harder from, all from of a St. sudden. Louis. That got harder all of a sudden. I thought that was not where I thought we were going with this question. Okay. Right-handed batteries in the top seven. Played from the teens to the 30s. First half of the career with the Cardinals. But then the Giants, Browns, etc. Uh, Giants for one season, Cubs for four seasons, and then... Excuse me, the St. Louis Browns for the last five years. What position did he play? He played second baseman, shortstop, and third baseman. But, okay. It's not who I thought it was. Uh, I'm sure oh. that it's not who you thought it was. They are You're who sure? You sure? That was, that was last episode. <laughs> um, so there's one question that could help if if you're unsure of like the type of league that he played in. That's good. What, what league? What league? That's a good question. Based on based on the teams that he played for, he was a major league player. Yeah. So he was not. Oh. Well, yeah, not, Cardinals. Yeah, yeah, not yeah, a, yeah. He was not a Negro League player. And I'll give you I'll give you one further. Three of the seven players ahead of Ed are Negro League players. Right. So, so we get rid of them. Four. But yeah, so he played for the course. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah, we played with the Cardinals, so he wouldn't have been. But who is it? Oh my gosh. Okay. It's always fun getting put on the spot, isn't it? Yeah, this isn't <laughs> as much fun as just doing it to you. Uh so there's only four guys above him that that played in yep. either well that would have been the National League almost all of them, um, only. 
Well, y- it's you, not Ty you, Cobb because he didn't play for the Tigers. I mean, he, he the person here didn't play for the Tigers, so it's not Ty correct. Cobb. Yep, that's not one of your questions. I'll take that. Honus Wagner played before this. He played like into the teens and twenties, so it's not it's not Honus Wagner. Um. Think of more questions if you, uh, if it's, it's confusing. <laughs> I, the two names in my head, the question I want to ask absolutely does not help me, uh, differentiate between which two it could be. Um, I don't remember which position either one of them played, but they both have weird names for like first and last names. So if I asked you that, do they have weird do they have weird name? names that's not gonna help me do anything with that um, oh, i am so, so you stoked. know it you, you know it's not ty cobb do you yeah. know the other three names that's like an important start tris speaker is one of them tris speaker is not one of them Tris speaker is not in the top seven tris speaker is number nine okay so let me ask you this does the person have a strange name like an abnormal first and last name yeah I, yeah, I would think so. Do you know anybody with no. either of his names? <laughs> no. That would be uh, <laughs> Rogers Hornsby? That's who it is. We got it? Okay. Rogers Hornsby. It took me way was... too long to get that. Oh, the Tris Speaker no. thing. I wanted You've been that. here for all of mine. It's fine. Yeah. Rogers <laughs> Hornsby. There Rogers Hornsby, yes. He played for 23 seasons. His career batting average is 358. And he, according to baseball reference, is the only right-handed hitter above Ed DeLahanty on this list. As a matter of fact, here's the really cool stat. And I like I didn't know the number, the principal stands, but the number is interesting. 15 of the top 20 hitters on the all-time career batting average list are lefties. I think I think if we looked at that on the other side, it's because there's so many right-handed pitchers, right? Yeah. The most successful pitchers would be right-handers, uh, and so the lefties get an advantage that way. That is interesting, yeah. though, that it's so but many. 75% is, is fascinating. I knew there were there are more left-handed hitters than there are like left-handed dominant people in society by a decent margin. I did not realize that it was 75% of the top 20, 15 of 20 are lefties. I found teach, that interesting. Teach your children to be left-handed. Strap their right hand behind their back. That's the deal. Baseball, we, better to be left-handed. Golf we courses, to, we need to start that right to now. To protect against right-handers. <laughs> Basketball. That, Basketball, that. you guard the guy to go to their right because if you don't know anything about them. So, left-handed. Be left-handed. See, we're gonna, yeah, starting that tomorrow <clears throat> yep. and drill in the backyard. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> back to Ed. So, this is uh this is where his his career uh, and life overall starts to take an interesting and negative turn. The nineteen oh one season still had a good season. Uh, he hit three fifty four and a hundred RBIs, but he only made three thousand dollars playing for the Phillies that season, and that's actually not very much more than he signed with the Phillies for as a rookie as like a young player. So he wasn't getting paid what he thought he should be getting paid. He wasn't being paid what he was thinking that he was worth. So after the 1901 season, he and nine of his Phillies teammates would all leave the Phillies after the upstart league, the American league Mm -hmm. founded in January, 1901. They had just had their inaugural season Everybody heard the rumblings that the American League had money and the National League were being stingy. And so he and nine of his teammates left the Phillies to go join the American League. So Ed signs with the Washington Senators. He signed for $4,000, $1,000 more than he was making with the Phillies after 10 seasons, 12 seasons with them, and a $1,000 signing bonus. So almost doubled his money. Uh, so he he played the 1902 season with the Phillies, excuse me, with the Senators, but 
an interesting thing happened. A court order said that players who left the Phillies after the 1901 season could not play Major League Baseball in Philadelphia against the Philadelphia Athletics, who were who was the American League team in Philadelphia at the time, now the Oakland A's. And a court order said that these Phillies players could not play baseball in the state of Pennsylvania. So Delahanty and his teammates, his former his former Philly teammates, current uh, current um, current senator teammates, would just hop off the train in Delaware when the when the team was on the way to go play the Athletics, and then they would just catch another train to the next destination. They would basically just skip a game. That, that season. Is- Go that's ahead. eerily. That's like parallel to like the the Kyrie Irving deal with the Nets this year. <laughs> just the opposite, because they yeah. can't play in this one city that they don't live in. He can't play in this one city that he happens to live in, which is worse. But that is uh, that is an interest. So they just the courts were just like, yeah, you can play baseball, you just can't play here. Mm-hmm. Dang it! Unless you're going to play. Had, courts had an interesting hand in uh, sports. Yes, baseball. forever. That's so because baseball at this time. Because it's not like they're playing; they're not playing the Phillies. No, they're playing the the A's. They're so the other the other American League team in Philadelphia. So he's not playing against his old team. He's playing just a. He's just playing in the state of Pennsylvania, which is which was against the court order. I'd like to have seen what the how, how is it worded, like right, like like how did right. they justify I would love that? To read because that. because if they'd have all signed for the A's. Would they have done? Is it the same ruling? Like you can't play for the home A's. Games. Then it would be a Kyrie Irving situation. <laughs> so <laughs> they play every game but the home games. So weird to tell them they just couldn't play in. It is in PA at all. Mm-hmm. Okay, don't know why, but uh, it was weird. But anyway, uh, the 1902 season, he still had a great year. Hit 376, which might be below his threshold. I mean, hitting 400 three times, but I would be happy with it if if, if it were me. But he may or may not be the batting champion for that year, which would have made him a two-time batting champion. Research has gone back and forth, and he and Nap LaJoy ended the 1902 season very, very close in batting average. One of them was pronounced the winner at the very end of the season, uh, a few months after the season ended. The other one was named the batting champion after further calculation. Research years later than... Turned it the other way, but Nap LaJoy only had 381 plate appearances, so if it were today, he wouldn't be eligible for the batting title. And so no one really knows. I think a Baseball Reference gives him a two-time batting champion, but I digress. This offseason was particularly troubling for, for De La Hanty. Then between 1902 and 1903, his wife fell ill, and then Ed blew all of his money gambling and drinking. And then he had a really weird contract situation that that I think that leads in, in it leads toward the further downfall. He signed with the New York Giants for either 6 or 8,000 dollars, I couldn't find a definitive answer, with a $4,000 advance on his salary. Now this is important. He got 4,000 of 4,000 dollars of his salary in advance at the beginning before the season started. During this offseason, though, the American League and the National League agreed to honor each other's contracts, which essentially voided his New York Giants contract and required that he paid back that advance, that $4,000 salary advance that he got. So he ended up coming back to Washington. He signed with them for $4,500 with a $600 advance before the season started, effectively meaning that he had to pay $100 to play for Washington that season. He and Washington had an argument. The Senators, he had a, he had an argument with them. They agreed to pay New York the $4,000 that he owed them. But $2,000 would be deducted from the 1903 salary and his 1904 salary to make up the difference. He was not happy. I, I <laughs> and with his, when, with his financial troubles, too, and his wife was sick, and he was drinking, and he was gambling... He probably had already spent that advance. Like it was gone. He didn't have it to send to somebody to pay off or like to pay it back before he could play. And so Washington eventually agreed to pay, but it would be taken out of his next two salaries. The question is because it's that sucks. Because if he signed the contract 
And then they agreed to honor contracts, which means he couldn't just switch leagues right. willy nilly. If 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 he signed the contract first, though, I don't know. Feels like he should have a, a an ability to sue in some way because that's he's got a piece of paper that says he can play there. And if he if they agreed to honor contracts first, why would the Giants even sign him? They would know better. So that tells me that that they the signing happened first, then they agreed to honor contracts and just voided everything that had happened that off season. That's it's not really yeah. something you should be able to do. So I would be upset if I was him too. And then then Washington's like, yeah, we'll pay the advance, but we're taking it out of your salary. We'll pay it today, I, but you're going to pay us back. Basically a loan. And he loses all leverage because the Giants were paying him more. But then because he can't move, the, the Senators are just free to do whatever. In that time, the reserve clause, they could pay him whatever they wanted to, and he stuck playing in Washington until yep. they cut him or trade him. He's got no, he's got no recourse. So better. that sucks for him. Mm-hmm. That's tough. And again, very different times. Litigation was very different. Sport was very different. Mm-hmm. Uh, very different times, of course. But this this comes back in a minute. So when Ed does finally show up to play during the 1903 season, he was out of shape, and he almost immediately suffered injuries because he just wasn't he just wasn't baseball he wasn't in baseball shape. Surprisingly. At the start of the season, he was still hitting 333, but he had a disagreement with Senators manager Tom Loftus. He made Ed play right field. Ed wanted to play left field. That was his comfortable position in the outfield. And for some reason, Loftus wanted him to play right field. So they had a they had a disagreement about that. And This may or may not have contributed to him starting up drinking again and his behavior started to escalate. This is when the time frame gets very particular. June 25th, they played a game. The Senators played a game in Cleveland uh, in his hometown. And Ed sees a newspaper report about the New York Giants purposefully defying that salary agreement situation that the two leagues had to sign a player and to let a player from the other league come and play for them. Ed decides to abandon the Senators and try to go to and wants to go to New York to sign with the Giants because he figures if if they if they'll sign one player for more money and defy this thing, uh, maybe he can go get his contract back or maybe he can get another contract but but for more money than the Senators, he can help his financial situation, you know, whatever. But along the way, Right after, all, uh, right after he abandoned the team, he started threatening suicide. He started threatening to hurt his teammates. Of course, this is probably all alcohol-induced. And he allegedly chases one of them with a knife while they were trying to help him and watch him in the hotel rooms with the team. He would rejoin the Senators. He would only rejoin them for two games. And he would abandon the team again. Um, on the, those two, those two senators games, the team actually called his mother and his brothers to try and come and talk to him because they was, he was just so out of control. He played two games with them and then left again. But another court order barred New York from defying that salary agreement. So just yet another court intervention that we have going on to the, in, in 1900s baseball. Delahanty decided that he still wanted to go try and play for New York. Uh, So he left all of his belongings in a Detroit hotel room and got on a train to New York. No belongings at all. On this train ride to New York, he smoked when he wasn't supposed to, where he wasn't supposed to. He drank excessively, and he basically misbehaved to the point that the conductor ordered him off the train in Ontario. So the train ride from Detroit to New York went through Canada apparently, which was interesting. Yeah, I actually have to go south from Detroit to go to Canada. So It's like, what? It's too far north to be real, so they, it shouldn't count as... <laughs> Detroit is basically Canada, is that what you're saying? Basically Canada. <laughs> they can have it, I think, too, depending on... Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. That's okay. Anyway. Anyway, so he's on this train, and the conductor basically kicks him off in Ontario. Well... I've never been to Buffalo or Ontario, but there is a bridge called the International Railway Bridge that connects Ontario to Buffalo and that crosses the Niagara River. 
this train left Ontario and took that bridge south towards New York. Well, Ed, stumbling around, probably in the cold, and walks out on to this bridge. And he was met by a night watchman who was supposed to be out looking for looking for looters and such. And and some somehow this night watchman struggled with Delahanty until Ed either fell into the water or stumbled off the bridge, off the edge, into the water. Uh, I, I, I believe I believe the story went they were struggling, the night watchman fell backwards. And then it was it was kind of foggy and the mist and stuff from the falls. And when he stood up and looked around, he was gone. Ed was gone. The night watchman couldn't see him. Seven days later, his body was found some 20 miles downstream from the in the Niagara River from the falls. And all he was wearing was a necktie and his socks. And that was the end of a great baseball career, very unfortunate end to a great baseball career. But like so many of the stories that we've told, alcohol and drugs and extracurriculars tend to influence so much of what happens in sports that there, there, it's just such an, it's such a cause and effect relationship with what happens outside of sport as to how you play. This actually ended up taking his life. And I, I want to say, I'm again, listeners, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, pr- we're pretty sure that he had the highest batting average, highest career batting average the day that he died, like all time. He was, he was major league baseball's all time greatest hitter on the day that he died. And even then it was downsloping just, just slightly from what his career average was, but just an unfortunate end to a great baseball career. Yeah, and it's it's that's actually how we uh, we stumbled, no pun intended, uh, onto this story, the hair, because uh, it's just a mysterious. It's one of those mysterious death situations, right? Like he's on a train. It's it's mysterious without being mysterious, really. Like it's it's kind of obvious that what happened, but but he just walked off into the night, and that was it. That was the end of his career. Uh, and, and you're right. It is a situation where some of the personal demons end up costing somebody and it happens a lot in life, not just sports, but you know, all walks of life. We see that. And, um, that is, I mean, it's tough. It's he had a lot of things go wrong all at one time. He, you know, got, got burned with a contract and, and just erratic behavior. But yeah, it's, it is strange that, that we, like I know Nat LaJoy, right? And I'm a baseball nerd, nerd, right? So so I get that. But but this is a contemporary and by all accounts, maybe a better, better player. Never heard of Ed Delahanty before. Uh, so it's just a, I don't know. It's one of those things, even in a sport that remembers its history as reverently as baseball, we still forget stuff in the cracks. And he slipped through the cracks because of the way he died. Even his... His Hall of Fame plaque just mentions that he died in an accident. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't mention anything else, right? And that's to be expected, right? You're going to get the the best version of your story on that. But but uh, definitely, definitely a tragic story and something you could learn from. Very much so. Very much so. And those those exterior those external demons that you that you mentioned happens to so many happens to so many sports people. Like you see, so many careers derailed, slowed down in their prime or not. Uh, Tiger Woods is one that just comes right off the bat to, in my mind that he was on top of the world. And then all of a sudden, I mean, he, yes, he won majors after the, after the incident and stuff, but he was never the same player after that, between that and injuries just started catching up to him. You think about, uh, you think about injuries that happen off the field, even not even, not even on the field injuries that totally unrelated to playing the sport. And just so much stuff that can, that can that can just literally kill a career, literally and figuratively kill a career, and it's unfortunate because he should be Ed should Ed Delahanty should be remembered for what happened on the field and his contributions to baseball, and not the circumstances surrounding his death. Like I, I just don't know. I just don't think that's fair personally. But um, I've got some some career stats for you on the way out. He finished his career. 
with 2,597 hits. So if he had kept playing, he might be in that 3,000 3, hit club. Uh, was not a power hitter, as you probably heard from some of my some of my stats earlier. I think his 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 season best home run year was like in the teens, yeah. but he had 101 home runs, 1,466 RBIs. He had 456 stolen bases, which I went and looked because it, I just wanted to know how many he had stolen because they mentioned his speed. 456 is actually 52nd all time. And that doesn't sound like a lot, and it really doesn't It doesn't look like a lot when you look at that list and you realize Ricky Henderson has almost four times as many stolen bases. <laughs> but anyway, his career batting average was 346, eighth all time, including Negro League players, but very likely the highest MLB mark at the time of his death. He has a career 505 slugging percentage and a career 917 OPS. All, all very good numbers. All, all time, I mean, all time. Not, not just, con, not just among contemporaries, but I mean, yes, baseball was a different. Baseball was a different game in the eighteen hundreds, and it's not the same today. <laughs> and it, it's like we but, know that it's okay. <laughs> but when you start comparing, I mean, like the the RBIs is like sixtieth all time. But when you look, he had eight thousand and some plate appearances. So the guys above him have two thousand more plate appearances than he does. And he's 60th all time without those. The hits numbers the same way. So, you know, his his career average might have tumbled if he played a full career, but his counting stats would definitely have been higher up. And, and ultimately, that's why he's in the Hall of Fame. Because even with a career cut short, it was an all-time great one. It is It is an incredible career. And again, we had not we had never heard his name Maybe we're in the minority with that. I don't think so, <laughs> but uh, I, I really don't think that's the case. But um, you can you can try and prove us wrong. We won't listen, but it's fine. Um, but yeah, unfortunate end to uh, to a wonderful baseball career, and uh, you hate to hear these stories, but it is inter- but it is interesting and useful and necessary in our eyes to to talk about these these careers and these athletes and their lives and stuff because again. They just slipped through the cracks, even even in a sport like baseball. Who remembers who remembers everything about Babe Ruth and and Ty Cobb, and then like eighth on the list, this guy you never heard of. So yep. if you if if you know any other people like this that you guys want us to cover, let us know. Reach out on social media. Uh, we'll we'll be glad to look into it. I, there are tons of these. There are tons of these. We're never going to run out of content, folks. Just remember that. Um, give us your ideas. Let us know what you think. And that's what you don't know about one of the greatest Major League Baseball hitters of all time, Ed De La Hanty. Until next time, bye. See ya. Thank you for listening to this episode of What You Don't Know About Sports. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please leave us a review, five stars only, and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen. If you have a great sports story, we want to hear about it. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WYDKAS Podcast, and on our YouTube channel at What You Don't Know About Sports Podcast. All episodes are written, recorded, and edited by us, Stay tuned for the next episode.